Thank you for joining the Northern Virginia Technology Council and Consumer Technology Association for this virtual masters in leadership series event. My name is Rich Montoni and I am chairman of NVTC and the vice chairman of Maximus Inc. I'm delighted to welcome you all here. We have a terrific lineup today. We have US Secretary of Labor, Eugene Scalia. He will be joining <laughs> CTA president and CEO Gary Shapiro in a fireside chat for the first 20 minutes. And then the Society for Human Resources Management, SHRM, CEO Johnny C. Taylor Jr. will join Gary for the rest of the hour. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Everybody has been muted. During the second fireside chat with SHRM CEO Johnny C. Taylor Jr., if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function to type out your question. It is located in the middle of the bottom bar on your screen. This series is made possible by our co-producer and partner sponsor, Consumer Technology Association, and by our premier sponsor, SAP. Thank you both for your support. If you would like to join them as a sponsor, please connect with Yolanda Lee at NBTC today. Now, I would like to introduce NBTC President and CEO Bobby Kilberg, who will say a few words. Bobby? Good morning. On a personal note to Jean, uh, Secretary Scalia, thank you for participating in this NVTC CTA webinar. It is very important for our memberships to hear from you as Secretary of Labor, and we appreciate your taking the time from an absolutely daunting schedule to do so. And to Johnny, thank you very, very much for joining us as CEO of SHRM. And now I will turn it over to Gary Shapiro. Gary. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Rich. Um, Johnny, great to have you here. I look forward to talking to you in a few minutes. But right now, the focus is on uh, probably the most important person in terms of who we're focusing our jobs and our labor market on, Eugene Scalia. He's the 28th US Secretary of Labor. He was nominated by President Trump in July 2019. Eight months later, the Senate confirmed him just this past September. And what a ride it's been in just eight months. Prior to assuming this role, uh, Sec Secretary Scalia worked as a solicitor of labor, the department's leading legal officer under former Secretary of Labor Elaine Chao. And while there, he worked to protect low-wage workers, strengthen enforcement of workplace safety laws, and lower regulatory burdens. He holds a law degree from the University of Chicago, where he also served as a lecturer, and his legal expertise is in labor, uh, as well as administrative and regulatory law. Welcome, Secretary Scalia. Gary, uh, thank you. It's a particular pleasure to join NBTC. Uh, Bobby Kilberg is uh, among the oldest of family friends, uh, uh, by which I mean the friendship is, is longstanding. She was is close to my parents, and uh, not only uh, helped me get my first job, which uh, was an accomplishment in itself, but actually uh, even more impressive, found, found the woman who married me. So I've, I'll always be indebted to uh, Bobby as well as her husband, Bill. Well, that is a heck of an endorsement of Bobby. Of course, we know her and love her. Um, but for your job, it's, it's the hot seat now. Last Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the Department of Labor issued its jobs report. A record loss, 20.5 million jobs, record high unemployment rate of 14.7%. What do you think? Well, it was uh, a grim report to put out on uh, Friday. Uh, Gary, you've uh, summarized the uh, sort of top line numbers, although I'll, I'll quibble with one phrase you used, uh, which is job losses. Uh, because uh, those 20.5 million jobs, uh, so many of them are actually still there. Uh, and that's part of what makes the downturn we're in right now uh, so unusual, uh, so daunting. But I think it holds a little more promise potentially uh, than past economic difficulties we've been in. This one's been, in a sense, self-induced, uh, not the result of uh, problems in the underlying economic fundamentals. And the concept, of course, has been that it's short term as well. Uh, so a, a lot of hardship right now for American workers, families, but there is the, the, the possibility that uh, we, we come out of this and, and get back to uh, where we were not so long ago. There's one uh, 
page in the uh, jobs report that, that we put out that uh, particularly caught my attention, and I'll, I'll try to show it to you. It's, it may be a little difficult for everybody to see it, but uh, what this reflects is uh, uh, whether people uh, identified themselves as on temporary or permanent layoff status. And what you see is people on temporary layoff status just absolutely skyrocketing over the last couple of months. But what's interesting, uh, permanent layoff, that's the blue line, comes up just a little bit, whereas if you go back to 2009, permanent uh, went up uh, uh, sharply, uh, temporary not much. Back then, uh, only about 30% of people said they were on temporary layoff. In our most recent survey, 88% people said they were on temporary layoff, expected to go back to their jobs. Part of my mission right now is to get them back there safely. Hmm. Well, that's a good explanation. I mean, but certainly you have been thrust into a very incredibly difficult situation. You started off record high employment the, the U.S. has ever had. And here in our lifetimes, this is probably the record unemployment. Um, our biggest labor crisis, maybe since 2008 or, or even before then. Uh, how is this, how has your prior experience led to this? Uh, your leadership guided you through this crisis? And what's been the biggest challenge in responding to this crisis? Uh, I, I feel prepared for the job. Uh, so hopefully that's of some comfort to uh, people watching us today. Uh, as you mentioned, I was at the department before. Uh, I'm very familiar with the agencies that I'm, I'm now in charge of as, as secretary. I was the principal legal officer here. So I dealt with uh, all of those agencies. Uh, we're spending a lot of time in OSHA right now because of workplace safety. That's an agency I know very well from my career. And uh, and then my uh, prior time in government uh, at other agencies, working with uh, Bill Barr at the Justice Department, I, I, I feel I do know my way around the government. Uh, and then uh, I spent most of my career as a labor and employment lawyer. So I know the private sector. I do understand the concerns that businesses will have right now, uh, as well as uh, those of workers. Uh, and so that private sector experience, I feel, has also helped prepare me for this very unexpected situation. Uh, you know, beyond that, uh, I felt blessed to step into the team that I did here at the Labor Department. The principal agency heads were already here. The deputy secretary is uh, the person that, had I been told, Gene, you can pick anybody as your deputy secretary, he's the person I would have picked. The uh, person who's now the chief legal officer is somebody uh, I've known a long time, who I think very highly of. So I, 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 I've been blessed with a strong team here and, and, a, and a good team and good relationships at the White House. Uh, in any administration, you tend to see a lot of press about uh, supposed uh, disagreements uh, at the White House, with the White House. That's not been my experience. It's been a good functioning team uh, across the administration as well. And then, um, and then just one final observation, something that's really been uh, helpful in a strange way, is this is such an enormous challenge to the nation, to the country, that uh, we're all more or less focused on the same thing right now. So I am the recipient of constant suggestions, ideas, as well as support. And uh, having all of us, really, in a sense, nationally as a team, the um, Vice President has spoken, I think, of a whole of nation approach. Uh, I'm a beneficiary of that. I've, there are governors, uh, uh, industry leaders, union leaders, uh, members of the Senate, House, all coming forward with suggestions that are, that are helping uh, guide us through this as well. Well, certainly uh, it's bipartisan. We want you to succeed. But what's been your biggest challenge? The most challenging part of uh, COVID-19 from the Labor Department perspective, and I suspect from others as well, has been how fluid and shape-shifting it is. Uh, things have moved very rapidly and, uh, and often in unexpected ways. You go back two months, uh, as this was getting underway, we actually put out a stupendous jobs report in early March for the month of February. Uh, you, you touched on it, Gary. We, we had 3.5% unemployment just in February. We uh, spun off about 250,000 jobs in the economy. Uh, and then all of a sudden we had this just extraordinary steep drop. Uh, and then the issues that I'm dealing with too are fluid, they're shape-shifting. Uh, early on, we were very focused on uh, a paid leave so that people who are sick would get out of the workplace. We did some things with the unemployment 
insurance rules to make that easier. Uh, then Congress, of course, provided paid leave to small business. But then within a, within a couple of weeks, paid leave became less important to a lot of workers because the jobs weren't there. And all of a sudden, we needed unemployment insurance. That took on a great uh, significance. Uh, I was very focused and still, on, still am to a degree, but uh, two, three, four weeks ago, very, very focused on just getting the new unemployment insurance law up and running, helping the states deal with their very old and sometimes bulky uh, computer systems to get those unemployment insurance benefits out. And yet now we're looking at reopening in the great majority of states, which means we will, should have an unprecedented wave of people coming off unemployment insurance. And so having struggled to help get them on, we now want to uh, look toward helping get them off. And, and so that's another way in which all of these things have uh, moved uh, extremely uh, quickly. Uh, so I, I would say that's the biggest challenge. Obviously, we're always mindful of the uh, personal impact. We talk a lot about numbers, but in various ways, we're each reminded of the personal impact, and that's always uh, hard to absorb as well. Well, you did mention the, the shift in emphasis that I think we're all hearing lately about the challenge of getting Americans back to work. So what's the DOL thinking on that and how can employers help? Well, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, I got this chart again. I don't know how well people can see it, but with this extraordinary soar of people, this red line, people um, who at least at the time they filed or at the time they were surveys regarded themselves as on temporary uh, unemployment. And, uh, and again, I, our focus is to uh, make that so and to open as, as promptly as we safely can, because I'm certainly mindful that uh, the longer that we take to reopen, uh, the, the uh, I think more of those bonds between employer and employee are weakened and, 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 and fall away. That's one of the reasons that I was a great supporter of the Paycheck Protection Program. It's not a program that we administer here at the Labor Department, but for me, it was all about the employment relationship, and it was about preserving that relationship so that when we reopen, the workers are there, the companies have staff, everybody can get going quickly. Um, and so I, I want to make that happen, and I want to help the governors do it, but of course, it's got to be safe. And um, it almost goes without saying, but from the Labor Department perspective, that means safe workplaces. Uh, we've put out an extraordinary amount of guidance through OSHA on steps that uh, uh, employers can and we think should be taking to protect their workers. Uh, we talk a lot about the reopening, but uh, we need to recall, and I think most folks on the phone uh, on, the, on this, on this uh, uh, call today know it, there, there are thousands of workplaces across the country that have been open all along and finding ways to keep safe. And we want to use that through guidance, through the example others have set, to keep workers safe. But uh, OSHA is getting complaints and conducting investigations too. And, and so it's a two-pronged approach for us when it comes to workplace safety. It's guidance and assistance, but where necessary, uh, we're prepared to uh, bring uh, enforcement actions as well. So those, those are some of the main issues that we're focused on right now. What about this, um, you mentioned the shift to getting people back to work, but the last several weeks I've heard from business executives in a range of industries, uh, indicating that the of emphasis of employees has followed the law. They see that uh, many employees have asked to be fired. They didn't want to work because they were getting paid more, plus 600, you know, getting unemployment plus $600 a week. Um, that's a factor where you had a well-intentioned law and you had some people taking advantage of it in a way that certainly wasn't intended. Uh, should those be the last to be rehired or there's, is there, what are the moral implications there? Do you feel good about wanting to extend that? What should happen there? There's a moral hazard that has clearly occurred. I mean, this is every industry, every executive, they're all talking about this. There was a strong consensus at the time of the CARES Act, which of course was late March. Strong consensus that something significant and additional needed to be done for the millions of people that were gonna be put on uh, unemployment. And uh, that resulted in th the provision of the CARES Act providing uh, $600 uh, weekly unemployment payments on top of uh, what's made available by the states. The situation here is just so different where people are being put out of work, not, not just through no fault of their own, which, which often is the case, 
but but really uh, as a matter of public health and safety. And we've never had people sacrifice in that way. That was the reason for this stepped up benefit. And also, I think very importantly, uh, extending these benefits to the self-employed, not only people in a traditional employment relationship. That said, it is uh, integral to the unemployment program that it's for people who don't have the ability to be at work. Uh, you can't quit your job because you think you'll do better on unemployment. Those people should not be getting unemployment. And when you're called back, and let's stipulate that workplace is safe, when you're called back, uh, you can't say, well, I'd just rather remain on unemployment. We have been reinforcing that uh, with the states from the time of enactment of the CARES Act. Our inspector general actually got $26 million into the CARES Act, which is uh, about a third of that office's annual budget. They got an additional third just to focus on potential uh, abuses within the unemployment insurance program. And we've certainly talked to the inspector general about focusing on abuses that may occur, occur with respect to people who have the opportunity to work, but, but aren't uh, taking that opportunity. And, uh, and something that we're also talking to the states about is just as we had record numbers of people coming on to unemployment, we will have people with the opportunity to leave unemployment as states reopen in record numbers as well. And the states will want systems by which they obtain notice from employers that workers are being called back so that the states can check their roles and make sure that those people, as they're called back, are leaving the unemployment insurance roles. And, and, and just finally, and I certainly am not um, unaware of the, as you put it, Gary, moral hazard that concerns some people, but do remember this program does expire uh, in July. And I think it's a bad decision for a worker to not go back to a job that's there in the thought that uh, he or she will get uh, a few hundred dollars a week for just a few more weeks. Uh, I, I don't think the incentive is as powerful, I hope, as some people fear. And you don't think it will be continued by Congress? Uh, let's see where we are. Uh, I, I think that the program that we adopted, where there's a flat payment amount, regardless of prior income, was one that we were forced into a bit uh, because of limitations in the state's computer systems. They really can't individualize payment amounts. If anything is done uh, past uh, July 30 when this expires, uh, it would warrant a very careful look as to whether the same mechanism we have right now, which it, uh, fit a particular purpose at a particular point in time. Uh, careful look will be whether continuing that particular delivery mechanism is the right way to go. So let's talk about the reopening, if you will. How will that be different? What will, how can we companies support it, business executives? And, and will the world look different? Um, will there be, we be going away from open office environments? Will people be teleworking more? Will there be more flexibility in terms of start times and closed times so people aren't on public transportation crowded. Will, have we forever changed the society? And, and how do we turn this horror into an opportunity where people get new skills? All good questions. Uh, things will clearly be different in some ways. I think we'll see more uh, teleworking. Undoubtedly, there are many people out there who hadn't really had much experience with it. And, and liked it better than they expected. Although I'm also confident that there are people uh, who have been confirmed in the view that teleworking is only second best. I'm probably one of those. It worked well for us here. Uh, we're 90 to 95% teleworking, uh, but I think uh, being in person, being present is often even better. But th that, that will be one change. You're right about uh, how we view mass transit, uh, at least in the near term, o open office spaces, uh, another idea that uh, I, I guess I confess I had some skepticism about, there will be uh, perhaps more now. Um, longer term, uh, we've pulled together as a nation to some extent. I, I don't think the analogies to World War II are misplaced. Uh, the challenge to the nation has been just immense. Uh, the sacrifice we've had to make has been different. Um, it's been in a way more introverted <laughs> than one thinks of when one thinks of being at war. But it's been a sacrifice. It's been a shared experience. I think some good will come of that. And uh, I, for one, uh, think there will be more focus on uh, American independence, on assuring American uh, economic 
and, and public health security. I think we've seen uh, dependencies we have, including with respect to China, uh, which has not uh, acquitted itself well in this experience that uh, many of us are going to want to revisit. So I think there'll be some changes uh, in trade policy that uh, will make sense even to those of us that, that recognize all the great benefits of, of free trade. And then finally, Gary, you, you mentioned apprenticeships. And uh, the, uh, it's funny, I, just a few months ago when the economy was roaring, uh, I would talk to uh, people like Johnny Taylor, by the way, we had a good conversation about what was being learned uh, over the last couple of years about training workers and particularly about apprenticeships and how important it was to, to remember those lessons and embed those lessons in our worker training systems because I would say someday, we can't know when, we'll have a downturn and we wanna be ready. And then, you know, two weeks later, there we were. Uh, and so we learned a lot um, recently about uh, worker training programs, apprenticeships are terrific. Actually, today is the day that we begin accepting applications for what we've called our industry recognized apprenticeship programs, which are meant to be an alternative model to our registered program, more flexible, much more suited to high tech. Uh, we've been working with some tech companies uh, about potentially becoming what we call standards recognition entities under our apprenticeship program. And we welcome applications and stand ready to help people apply for that because there is obviously going to need to be uh, worker retraining. I was talking to uh, a CEO of a major uh, uh, tech company today uh, that is hiring and there are companies hiring. Uh, we One lesson that we gained uh, in the last few years is how to better train people and we'll be applying that too. Well, thank you for ending on that optimistic note about getting some lemonade out of this lemon. Uh, I appreciate what you do. We're all rooting for you and I wanna respect your time. So thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to join you all. Bobby, thank you as well. You're welcome, Gene, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now I'm gonna to turn to uh, Johnny C. Taylor. He's the president and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management. Over 300,000 members, making them the largest HR professional association in the world. Heck, it's actually one of the largest associations in the world. Let's be honest here. Uh, he actually leads the national conversation on the workplace. He's often testifying before Congress, and he writes a weekly Ask HR column in USA Today. In addition to being uh, a practicing lawyer in, in three different uh, jurisdictions, he has held executive leadership positions at IAC Interactive Corp, Viacom's Paramount Pictures, Compass Group USA, among others. And prior to joining uh, SHRM, he was president and CEO of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. He serves on the boards of the University of Miami, his undergraduate alma mater, Jobs for America graduates, and the American Red Cross. And in 2018, he was appointed uh, by President Trump as chairman of the President's Advisory Board on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And he's also a member of the American Workforce Policy Advisory Board. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Johnny. Hey, Gary. You're a legend. I saw you on CNBC in an ad this morning. I said, wait a second. How could he be in two places at once? So any, uh, any immediate reaction to what Secretary Scalia said? You know, he, he was spot on and, and he alluded to the fact that we'd had some early conversations. What I'd say to you is, uh, you know, what I love about the American people in particular is how resilient we are. And, you know, your question about, you know, what's the new normal going to look like? I'm betting, and I could be wrong, by the way, but all of our research says to us that it's going to be more normal than we think. Yeah, there are going to be some differences. People are not likely to handshake and embrace like they used to. I mean, we will represent, so, right, fist bumps, head nods, all of that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I think we're seeing people kind of quickly gravitate. I was talking to a group of millennials the other day on this show, it was hilarious, and Generation Z, and I shared with them, you know, we all thought after 911, those of us who are gray enough to know, after 911 that the world would change, right? And it would never happen and people wouldn't fly and da da da. And it's amazing how resilient the American people are and how we, yes, it's different. I used to be able to walk up to the plane side and put my mom on the plane and all of that. And so now there's some security mechanisms PPE, if you will, and 
but we got back to flying. And I think this too shall pass. I'm an optimist. And again, I could be wrong here, but I'm convinced. And I think the secretary ended on that note that we're going to have a new normal, but I don't think it's going to be that abnormal. Great, great point. Um, well, tell us, what will it look like on the other side of the crisis? What, what will change and what will stay the same? Well, a couple of things that we know that are going to change. I mentioned just how we interact with people. You're going to be less likely to touch people. Talking about personal space, we're going to recognize that. Now, whether or not it'll be two, uh, six feet or two meters, I don't know. I mean, I think there's some reality setting in. I was reading an article this morning about a United Airlines flight. You know, the reality is there's just, it's going to be really hard to keep people two meters apart, six feet apart in every one of their interactions. What we know is public transportation is the biggest concern. Everyone's focused about what happens when you get to the office, taking temperatures, um, offering masks, and you know, all of those sorts of things. The real question, especially in you know, heavily populated areas like a New York City, is there's just no way, even if you staggered it, you couldn't push 8 million people right into that area under that short of, you know, and you could stagger it forever and people would never get to work. So the other big change, so public transportation, how people think about it, how they're going to interact with it is going to be a real big question mark. The second one, though, is remote work. In the past, we thought of remote work as something that your employer offered as a perk or as an accommodation. Uh, you, someone was sick, kid out, et cetera. Now we're really looking at whether or not all of those jobs that used to come into a physical place, uh, whether or not we need to do that. And I think we're going to bring a lot of people back to the workplace because there is something to be said for esprit de corps. There's, you know, culture and interaction. But I think I know, for example, there was a recent Gartner report that suggested that 75% or more of C CFOs are now sitting down saying, you know, those jobs that we thought that couldn't be done remotely can and have actually done pretty done it nicely. So I think we are going to see it become more common. And then the last area that we're seeing is, you know, a big focus on mental health. What we've seen from all of, you know, physical health we all understood, but people really did not have a full appreciation for the impact of forced work remote or forced isolation. And we are seeing it, everyone thought it was a great idea, but we're seeing employees really under stress, depression, domestic violence, divorce, I mean, go down the list. People are really struggling with this assumption that everyone wanted to work remotely, um, ignores the fact that no one wanted to be mandated to work remotely. You're right, good point. Uh, Mark Vanderhoff of Salesforce said 37% of their employers are having mental health issues. And I think it's, I mean, there's a variety of circumstances out there where, you know, people being stuck with kids and kids don't even have playgrounds, much less schools anymore. And, or, or just being alone is difficult or taking care of a loved one or worrying about multi-generational families. There's so many different cases out there. But right now, 64% of uh, salaried U.S. employees are working from home. That's right. Um, and the question is how much of that will continue? And, and what role will technology play in that? I mean, you're talking to two big technology groups, one a national association, the other the uh, Northern Virginia Technology Association. Uh, is technology going to continue to play a role? Will, that, will the Zoom things we're doing be part of regular what we do? And we, we have to wear ties for them. <laughs> well, let me tell you, thank God for all of the technology providers and the companies that you represent, because I cannot imagine, you know, back this up a decade and God forbid 20 years, what will we do? Whatever has happened to our economy, imagine what would happen if we weren't able to continue transacting business at some level remotely. So thank God for the technology companies and the investment and, and all of the work that your member companies are doing. I think we are now more reliant on it and we're going to become more reliant. And as you get these systems to kind of, you know, every once in a while we have a quirk, it doesn't work the way we want it to work, but it's going to get better. And I think we will all use it um, far more effectively to become more efficient and effective in our role. So great stop there. But people will have to learn how to do it. I think the answer is somewhere in between. It's not, you said it, 64% of people are, you know, working remotely now. Uh, there are a significant number of people, and our research is telling us, Sherm does this research poll, we're taking these spot surveys constantly, pulse surveys is what they call them. But in any event, what they're saying is that a lot of folks say, I'd like some version of it. Like, I don't want, again, mandatory work from home. If I have a child, I'd love to do that. Just put up on your slide now. 32% of, of, of our employees are saying, like, 
um, I've been furloughed, laid off, and if the option is I can get back to work by working remotely, I'd love to do it. The most important one that you pointed out is 68% of employers uh, believe they're done with their layoffs. That's good news. Now the downside is 32%, maybe not so much. 64% um, of them are working remotely. Now I'll give you some stats, stats later on. We believe that as you break that down between hourly employees and salaried employees, that we're going to see a shift of who's going to come back to work and when. That's a really interesting slide. And that tells that those are big numbers there. But in terms of uh, from an employer perspective, and we certainly have a lot of them watching uh, at the executive level, the fact is employees have different views. Some are very fearful about returning to work. Others just can't wait. Uh, how should employers deal with this? Uh, what, what can we do? Do we go to an open office environment? Do we get rid of the open office environment? Do we um, use technology more? Does every, for our association, all our employees got a special um, technology fund to use because they were working from home and that costs some money. Um, is that become standard? The flexible hours become standard. Where do you see this going, John? You're the, the number one expert in the country on all this. So what well, do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm practicing. I used to say that when I was in law. I said, I'm practicing, guys. Give me a break. Um, but, uh, but what I will say to you, Gary, is that we're going to see a couple of things. All of that's true. Yes, we're going to revisit whether or not some roles can permanently be done remotely. We're going to, you know, when you come into the office, there'll be precautions. Some companies, depending upon their CEO's predisposition, depending upon their culture, are going to have thermometers at the front door. They're going to have you sign these documents that say, I mean, we're going to run the gamut. PPE will be common. All of that, yes. The real, though, question when, when it's all said and done is, whether or not we think it's going to fundamentally and forever change. One of the stats that we have, and it's one that should be on your, on your slide, the bottom one, is 99% of U.S. employers expect furloughed salaried workers to return to work within six months. So again, this idea that you know, this is going to forever change us and we'll operate differently, sure, we'll reconsider how we lay out office spaces, configuration, you know, touchless doors. I, for, ex, I expect fully that we're going to have more touchless doors. There's no reason for you to have to hit that elevator and touch a button every time. So we're going to figure out all of that. But here's the advice that we're giving our employers, and this is across industry, right, is employers have to be very careful. Words matter. And when you say to an employee, I will bring you back when this workplace is safe. It's, it's like that statement that we will be transparent with you. Well, sort of. You'll be as transparent as you reasonably and respectfully can be. But promising employees safety is, is you're going to do your best to provide them the safest, reasonably safe. Like you've got a word that I would tell that to all of your members, be very carefully over-promising. OSHA doesn't say you're going to have a workplace that will be guaranteed safe. It isn't how it works. So we're, we're really saying be careful with your words because employees are listening to you. And if you make those commitments, it'll undermine their overall trust in you. The other point that we really advise companies to do and employers broadly, whether they're for profit, not profit, public sector, is when, when you're talking to people about you know, their fear, there are some people who have a generalized fear. I had someone say to me the other day, I'm not coming back to work until they have a vaccine. And I said, well, you may not have a job then. And I was just blunt. I mean, the reality is, I understand we're going to do as much of this as we can remotely. I'm going to do everything I can to make the environment as safe as I reasonably can. But you can't just say, I don't feel comfortable coming to work because of COVID and I'm going to come when I want to come. It doesn't work that way. So employers have to be very, very careful in their word choice and be honest with their employees. Um, tell them this is what our culture is. So think about the frontliners. I mean, frontline, um, first line, uh, first responders. They can't say I'm a nurse and I'm not coming to work. It doesn't work that way. Certain jobs have to be done in person. And what we're going to do is protect you as much as we can. So it's words. And I think the communication, partnering HR, technology, your communications and marketing teams is going to be critical. Don't make promises you can't deliver on. I think that's really good advice. And I appreciate that. One of the things, you're right, Americans want a safe environment. We've, we've, we have a first world problem here that we think everything is guaranteed and, and there are risks though. And one of the concerns I've heard from employers, and I'd like to know what you, you're working with all the HR people, if it's a concern there as well, is liability. 
is no matter what an employer does, you can recognize there could be a risk of transmission, especially with this terrible virus where the symptoms don't appear for a while. You could be asymptomatic and contagious. You could be an asymptomatic uh, case, which is not good because it spreads it to people around them. Korea is facing that problem from a guy who visited several bars recently. I bet. What, it, what about liability? Is this a job now of Congress to step in and say, look, employers, gross negligence is still bad, but, but let's be reasonable here. This is not the trial lawyer's relief act here. I mean, you're, you were trained as a lawyer. I was trained as a lawyer. We know what lawyers are like. For them, <laughs> it's just a business and it's a, it's a tax that American employers pay. It's a VIG that, we, that our competitors around the world just don't pay. What are we doing about that? Well, I'm hoping that what we're doing is just as you, you, I think we should be walking the halls of Congress, if you're walking them virtually or otherwise, talking with members and saying, we really do need to give some protection. To your point, not for irresponsible employers. If you know, for example, that you're in a workplace and two or three people on a floor have tested positive for COVID, the notion that you would keep people coming to work every day, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you got to be careful and smart, right? I get that part. But if we open this door, as we know, uh, to litigation for everything, uh, it, it just won't work. And let me tell you something, Gary, no one, and I know I'm very careful when I say this because people think, oh, you're comparing COVID to the flu. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people die, unfortunately, every year because of the flu. Imagine if employees uh, or the families of people who, who died because of the flu could bring an action against their employer because the employer brought them to work and exposed them to it. I mean, the, you know, and again, I'm not comparing COVID and the flu. That's not, that's what the epidemiologists are trained to do. That's not what I do. But there are all number and sorts of diseases that one can contract at work under, and under normal, good, safe practices. And I just can't imagine that we think it makes sense from a global competitiveness standpoint for American employers to have to shoulder that burden. And so Congress does need to act. And I agree with that. Boy, let's uh, shift over to skills. Is this, a, is this an opportunity here that, for people to reskill during this break? Is it, do, will there be a long impact, uh, term impact about a skills gap? Is this, a, should we shift as a country? What are HR departments thinking here? What are you suggesting? Well, we've been talking about it for a while, the need for people to be lifelong learners and the need for people to be constantly reskilling, upskilling uh, themselves. And now, you know, here we are forced to deal with it because a number of employers are revisiting, as we pointed out earlier, right now, CFOs are saying, do I need that job? And do I need a human being? to do that job. We've been talking about AI and automation and robots and its impact. Well, during this prolonged period, we're all revisiting whether or not we need the same number of employees to do the same type of work they've done in the past. To me, that is a call for employees to seize and employers, but specifically personal accountability. You and I realized, and, and, and I can say this, when we were in law school, I mean, we there was a different type of practice that you were engaged in, document production, computers do it now. So, you know, you've just got to constantly reskill and we've got to emphasize to people that their failure to do it will result in their job loss. So it's not necessarily COVID. A number of these jobs, as the secretary pointed out, are actually furloughs. They're coming back to work. The question is, will you be prepared to do the new work? And so one of the things that we're encouraging, I mean, my heart goes out to the high school graduates and the college graduates of 2020. They're coming into an ugly job market. I thought I'd seen ugly job markets before, but this is one. And what we've said to them is while you're out for these six, seven, eight, 10 weeks, whatever it is, you should be reskilling. And there are all sorts of online, Coursera, Udacity, LinkedIn Learning. There are all of these opportunities for all of us to learn something new while we're out so that when you do go back into the workplace, you actually can be more of an added value to your employer. So lifelong learning using all of the technology that you all have enabled, um, that technology enables us to do, is we've got to now stop just talking about retraining and retrain people. Uh, I have a question here from the audience. Does uh, Sharm have templates for policies to bring people back to work for workplace safety? I'm hearing what the CEO is saying about being careful with our words. 
Yes, we do. So I'd encourage everyone, we've actually set up a, a microsite within our site, but if you go to sherm.org, not to be a commercial, but we literally have templates, we have best in class, and they're updated literally daily, because every day something comes out, and it's by state. So we're learning that various states want to handle it differently. So we're strongly encouraging people to go to our, our website that we've stood up for navigating COVID-19. It's at sherm.org backslash back to work, and a front slash. I always get them confused. It's funny, the other day I told my daughter, I used, I said, you know, the pound sign. And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? It's so dated. I said, oh, the hashtag, I'm sorry. Um, but the point is we, we've absolutely stood this up and we are updating it constantly. So you have the latest information from the public health and epidemiology world, the CDC, the World Health Organization, as well as what employers are doing. And we do have, the secretary alluded to this uh, or specifically spoke to it. We actually have some companies that worked through this. So it's not that all of us are doing this for the first time. We're learning from employers. You, knew, you, you saw that Boeing announced a couple of weeks back, bringing 27,000 people back to work in Washington state. So we have been monitoring very closely. What did they learn so that all of your, your the folks who are watching this, um, that are participating in this webinar can go to our website and we'll tell you what they learned. That's a great point. There's a, uh, another question, you know, and I'm not saying, I haven't heard about this, so I'm not sure it's accurate, but it says the California governor just signed an executive order stating that employees who've been at work and contract COVID-19 will qualify for work with compensation benefits and it will be presumed that they contract the virus at work. So the liability is on the employer. How can employers in multiple states navigate these state-by-state -state executive orders? Which is true for a lot of major companies. All of a sudden, every governor now is doing something different in every state legislature. Do you foresee this type of executive order to be picked up by other states or federally? I hope not. I mean, we oftentimes refer to, you know, especially in the law, employment law, what starts in California on the West Coast makes its way across the country. I'm hoping this one stops right away. I don't know. This would be cutting edge, and I'm sure my, my folks right now are already looking at it. They may be chatting, but I don't know what the, what the Governor Newsom has done in California, but I will tell you, and I would say this, to presume that someone uh, contracted uh, COVID virus at work just because they're an employee of yours is way over the top to me, one man's opinion. Well, that's for sure, especially since the, uh, there's been very few tests for COVID-19 out there. A lot of people are never tested and then you get an antibody test four or five months later and someone says, oh, I got this here. It's absurd right. because there's right. several months intervening. It's difficult to figure out where you got it. Um, my wife had COVID-19. She thinks she got it at work because she's a frontline doctor. And I'm pretty right. sure she did get at work, but she was fine. She just lost her sense of smell. She tested positive for antibodies. And, um, you know, I'm hoping I have those antibodies too, because I'm living with it. <laughs> bless so, exactly. You did, um, I do have to uh, point out, you did make a difference between COVID and the flu. There's a couple of people who have filed comments, um, not exactly agreeing with you. One of them says that if the people have flu uh, show symptoms, and it's obviously very different. It's different in a thousand other ways. We know it's a little about, there's some herd immunity, there's vaccines, there's all sorts of things. And it's definitely more horrible than the flu. Uh, but I understand your point was, is it, you were just using it as an example of where you get sick. So yeah, and, uh, and, and, there, and that's why I said, I mean, the fact of the matter is whatever it is, name the condition, the fact of the matter is, uh, you, you, we know that people contract things at work. As long as human beings uh, interact, they will have the risk of that. And that's the point of it. But that does seem to go to the debate that's occurring. We're having Chris Christie uh, on this uh, next, and he wrote a rather controversial Washington Post um, commentary where he talked about let's get back to work type of thing. And, and now clearly there is a tension. Everyone's saying let's get back to work. Not everyone. Uh, our federal leadership, some state governors, a lot of people are frustrated. There's, there's demonstrations in state capitals. It's almost a, a little bit of a rural urban divide, a little bit of a political party divide. Um, and it's dividing us where we were pretty much united on this before. And I, I'd like to know where, if you guys or you have a view on that. I mean, is it too soon? Is it too much? Is it all at once? Is it gradual? Is it regional? What do, what do you, if you were the the person in the White House, which you might be someday given watching your career, Johnny, I'm just telling you, uh, if you had to press that, make those decisions, what would you be saying there? So, you know, I was on a, on a panel discussion with uh, Dr. Tedros from the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization last week. And 
he said so, two things that really stand out and I think inform what I think about this. One, he said, we've got to balance lives or factor in lives and livelihoods. Okay, so, you know, yes, there are the healthcare considerations that have to be taken into consideration, but then he went on to say that uh, either he or someone else on the call, but they, the group was basically suggesting that uh, the pandemic will kill, but uh, starvation is going to kill a lot more. That around the globe, the impact of not factoring in uh, that people need to eat, they need to work, livelihoods are important, and so are lives. And so trying to figure out how to balance that to get the economies globally back to work. One guy was saying that in the less in non-westernized parts of the world, less developed parts of the world, what we're not thinking about is the wake effect of, you know, if America shut down, and the UK and then Germany, et cetera, then a lot of that uh, production, manufacturing, what have you, that was being done in less developed countries, and those less developed countries don't have the social nets that we have, the safety nets, those people are, could face starvation. So this is in this big, thing called the globe, this big family that we're all a part of. We've got to get people back to work. Now, must we do it responsibly? Yes. Must we do it as reasonably safely as we can? Yes. And we're doing that. That's what I'm saying. We've great learnings from companies that didn't close. Uh, as we're reopening, we're capturing best practices and we're practicing. We don't know. Some of the things we're going to try will work and some won't. But the idea that we should not start moving, I was listening to uh, this morning on, I guess it was MSNBC or one of the channels, and uh, Tudor, the billionaire hedge fund guy or whatever, said, uh, you know, if we do this for another year while we wait for a vaccine, literally, we will be into a second depression. I mean, and like a real depression, not a recession, but a depression. So balancing those two, I therefore, if you ask me, I'm the president, I think we start moving smartly toward reopening. I hear you. I mean, there is a tension there. On the one hand, you do have, um, you know, the whole point was flatten the curve, not stop everyone from getting it. And we've clearly flattened the curve. There's, That's right. Other than New York, the hospital strain has not been overwhelming, um, where, in fact, there was an article in the New York Times yesterday that a lot of the hospitals that have been built um, by the federal government, most of them just aren't being used. I mean, hundreds yes. of millions of dollars basically were ready, were spent building temporary structures and just a few hundred, if, if not, people were used for thousands of beds. Uh, I got a lot of notes that the citing the um, California Workers Compensation. It is a law. It's, it's a rebuttable presumption. Um, you know, for the first time in my life, I think I'm thinking I understand Elon Musk now. <laughs> California is definitely its own Same country. Thing. It's not very worker, work, worker. Uh, well, it's not very employer friendly. Let me put it that way. Right. Um, there's a there's a question here that's interesting because this affects a lot of people. Do you see an appetite for raising the minimum wage, especially for healthcare workers, restaurant, retail, and hotel workers? Or is that something you don't get involved in? Well, so we think employers, the market will, will, will respond to that. Here, here's the real challenge. We, and, and you talked about it when you talked with the secretary. You have people effectively making $24, $25 an hour under the current uh, COVID plan that's set to expire in July. But I just saw that uh, certain members of the House and Senate have proposed post-July a plan that puts $2,000 per American making under $120,000 a year. So in a household married couple could get $4,000 a month and then $2,000 per kid for each of up to three kids. I mean, do the math. That means a family of uh, you know, husband, wife, three kids could get 10 grand a month under this proposed plan. Um, we do have to revisit how this thing is all going to work out because someone's got to pay for it. I was tickled the other day. I said, you know, six months ago, hell, four months ago, we were talking about the, the deficit. And now we seem to be willing to, to do kind of whatever. I'm not sure that I would agree that, that we, we need to be smart about getting people back to work is the short of it, Gary, because there are costs to people not working. And therefore, back to the, the specific question around minimum wage, that'll be interesting because in some ways, and the reason I brought that up is we're paying people in some states as much as $24, $25 an hour between the federal and the state plan, which means for all those crashes for $15 an hour, I mean, what's the new argument for 20, 25? I don't know. 
you know? I, I can tell you this, one thing I know is that most of these costs, almost all of them inv inevitably flow down. So, you know, if Walmart's got to take these minimum wage up to meet and compete with the federal government in this plan or the future plan, believe me, the cost of your, your visit to the convenience, the, to the store are going to be, you're going to, you, you will reflect that. Someone's got to pay for it. Well, let's talk a little bit about diversity. Maybe not in the sense that a lot of people, the way people think about it. Let's talk about generational diversity, because right now we have five different generations in, yes. in the workforce. Um, and, and we see it a lot in, in the tech industry. Uh, talk about the benefits that tech companies and others can gain from hiring across generations. And what, what can the tech industry do to support generational diversity in the workplace? Well, I love that. And, you know, we've been talking about at SHRM tapping into untapped pools of talent. It included not just, you know, as you said, the traditional race, gender, et cetera, but age and the formerly incarcerated, disabled, and veterans. I mean, so people, the people from the disabled community, uh, or, uh, and so, so what we've been saying is that this is an opportunity for the tech community and others. I think there are two observations specifically with respect to age. Uh, folks are in the workplace now, a number of people, 60 plus, because they need to be. And COVID has highlighted it. If you've seen your 401k plan, in many instances, that's now 201k, as we say. I mean, it's been ugly these last couple of months. And so many of these folks relying on fixed incomes need to go back to work and actually continue to add value. We also see that there's some value, and we're hearing this from millennials and Generation Z in reverse mentoring. So the, there's a lot that older workers can teach younger workers in the workplace. Resilience, going through tough times, how it all works out. You know, you've, these, many of these kids were only born in a generation when things went up. They've never had to deal with this. And so being able to go look at someone who says, let me tell you, went through that, 2008, went through 911. Why 2K? I mean, like all of these things, you give them perspective. That's one. The flip side is you can use your younger uh, folks to, to provide reverse mentoring, if you will, to teach late technology and teach these non-digital natives how to be more productive for longer. And we're ignoring the fact, no one talks about this, but we talk about it a lot. Starting in the year 2000, the American birth rates went on a decline. We still, notwithstanding the current 20.5 million people who filed for unemployment benefits last night, we're gonna have, last uh, week, we're going to have a real birth rate problem in America. We have one, but the effects of it will be significant. So we're going to need people to remain in the workplace for a much longer period of time. We won't have the luxury. Just before this all, we were at 3.5% on unemployment rate. We used to say 4% of Americans don't want to work anyway. So we were begging people to come to work anyway. We're going to need older workers to be retooled reskilled so that when this economy comes back and it will post COVID, when it does, we have people trained and be and, and able to come into the workplace. So it's good. It's just smart. Do it now. I, I hear you on that, but back to COVID, I mean, it does raise some questions about um, you have a weird virus, which is killing people, mostly 95% of them are over 60. In a lot of states, actually, the, the, the average age of death is beyond the average life expectancy. In other words, it's really going after selecting, I mean, it does go after others with comorbidities, but it's really going after older people. I'm over 60, so I'm in that category. Are these the people that should be last in back into the office, or is that just going to naturally happen? How will that affect things in the long term? And how about other people with other comorbidities? They're, they're less likely to want to come to the office if they have a vulnerable immune system, if they're a, a grossly obese, if there is um, a history of cancer, all these comorbidities that are there. And, and you know, we have, Amer we talk about why we have the most deaths in the US. Well, we do have a lot of obese people. We do have a lot of more people surviving cancer, thankfully. We have more people on kidney dialysis in any other country, proportionally. We're, we're at all these extremes because we've done a great job keeping people alive, but now these are the people that are most jeopardized. And will there be some type of challenge in bringing people back into the workforce um, as we get through this transition period. So, uh, and again, those words matter. We can bring people back to work. We don't necessarily have to bring them back to the workplace right, in the right. traditional sense. So a number, because of, again, all of the wonders of technology, 
we can still hire older workers and they can work remotely. We can still hire people who have comorbidities, who uh, have compromised immune systems. They just don't necessarily have to come into the workplace. So it's not a workforce issue. In fact, if COVID has done nothing else for us, it has shown us that we can actually hire these people. I talked about, you know, disabled people with disabilities who are, you know, as we say, people uh, with, uh, who are able to come into the work and show their abilities, they may do it remotely going forward. So I think that's the biggest uh, sell for us is that I think we're gonna have the opportunity to, you know, cast our nets a lot more. People don't have to necessarily show up in the workplace. But here's something that I am concerned about because we've been big, big proponents of uh, you know, the fight against ageism. We shouldn't make generalizations. I mean, Gary, I'm looking at you. You're a young, healthy guy. You can be 62. I would hate for an employer to say, well, you know, I want Gary to work here and the job does require that you come into the workplace, but because he's over 60, he's at risk. So I'm gonna hire the 40 year old. That is what we have to be careful too, is making assumptions. All 60 year olds aren't compromised and frankly, all 30 year olds aren't healthy. So, you know, and, and even if they look healthy, they're just not. You could probably, you know, take a couple of them on yourself, it looks like, right? So I just, we have to be really careful as a former employment lawyer with make, you know, buying into stereotypes and grouping big, you know, taking groups of people and saying, you're too old to come into the workplace. You're too sick to come into the workplace. You have a disability. We've been there, done that, and that the results are horrible. So on an individualized basis, determine whether or not a person, A, has the skills that you need. Once you determine that, then say, but can I allow that person to work remotely? And if so, you get this the best of both worlds. They're adding to our economy and you're getting the best talent. Well, Johnny, this has been great chatting with you. You speak my language. We have a similar background. I am now going to thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. It's been, it's been terrific. I've learned a lot and I hope our audience did as well. And now I'll turn it over to, back to Kara, the NBTC. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, very exciting and uh, interesting conversation from both uh, Secretary Scalia and Johnny. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us. Um, and uh, lastly, I would just like to tell everyone that we are hosting the former New, New Jersey Governor, Chris Christie, on May 22nd. Uh, you can go to our website, which is nbt.com nvtc.org to register to attend this event on May 22nd. Uh, we hope to see you there. In the meantime, we'll close this uh, webinar as we close all of our events here at NVTC. Please stay safe and stay healthy, and we hope to see you later this week at another one of our events. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jen.